Preflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. In general, man clings to the idea that benefits always come because of good conduct. So we, man, man believes that this great thing that happened in my life happened because I was good. Your story is just beginning. The 2024 Change Experience Tour is where you need to be. Meet Creflo Dollar on Friday, April 26th at the Centennial Memorial Temple in New York, New York to be renewed by the Word and reminded that you are made new in Christ. Your story isn't over. RSVP today. Text CHANGE2024 to 51555. Visit CreflodollarMinistries.org or scan the QR code on your screen. This is your world, so let's vow to make it a better place. Let every heart that needs to know, you love is here to stay. Oh, it's time we live a new life. Oh, let us love shine bright in you. We're saved by His grace, so we embrace your love today. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. Now, this is going to be interesting. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm often, again, asking God, give me the utterance, uh, show me how to say the thing that I see. And uh, this is big. This is big. This is, I don't think there's anybody in here who hasn't experienced some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today. And... I don't know, maybe for 40, for 40 some years I've known it. I don't know if I've said it clear enough, but I'm gonna be real clear today uh, about this. Uh, God's ways and man's ways. And sometimes we wanna make God's way like it's man's way. Uh, and then sometimes we want to make man's way like it's God's way. It's different. And, it, and, and it's time for us to see uh, distinctly how different it is, God's way and man's way. God is not a man. Okay? Now, that scripture says God is not a man that he should lie. But God is not a man that he should do almost anything like man does it. And we love taking human experiences and using those for examples to try to, you know, uh, to say that's God. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that in some areas. But I think this will be interesting. Let's go ahead and get started. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Now, I'm going to stop every now and then to make sure that we're all on the same bus and, 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 and doing this. All right, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher, the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher. My ways higher than your ways. My ways are not on the same level as your ways. My ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Now, later on in the scripture, he goes on and he says, and I gave you my word, so you can kind of get a hold of this. But now, I want to focus in on his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher. And in what way is this? So in no instance in this uh, situation, more true, it's, it's more, more true than connecting with the promptings to proper conduct. So when we look at his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, this is very true when it deals with, with uh, uh, proper conduct, that God's ways are prompting us to do right and live white, right. God's ways of getting us to, to live godly and God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. 
the, the whole objective here is how do I prompt you to proper conduct as Christian people? Uh, am I gonna am I gonna beat you down with fear to try to get you to act right? <laughs> God says no. That's 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 man's way. My way's higher. My thoughts are higher. Now why is this so? Because under grace, God does everything apart from human merit. He does everything apart from human merit. Uh, the word merit just simply means deserving praise or reward. So God does everything apart from humans deserving praise or deserving a reward. So a man does things, you know, that you deserve. God says, no, I'm doing things apart from you uh, deserving praise and deserving reward. God's not uh, giving you praise and rewards because you deserve it. If you understand that, say amen. Okay. And uh, he's not, he's not, he doesn't have a thought of repayment. In other words, you came to church today. He ain't repaying you with nothing because you came to church today. No, 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 he's not, he's not doing that. So he cannot, God cannot offer his blessings as an inducement. He, he can't offer his blessings to influence someone to do something. <laughs> That's what it means, an inducement to influence someone to do something. So he's going to bless you to influence you to live right. So if God gives me the money to get my house, then I'm going to live right. He can't do that. God cannot use his blessings for inducement. He cannot use his blessings to try to get you uh, to do something. You see why I want to take my time with this? I want, I, want you, I want to drive out tradition this morning. I thought that. I thought, well, you know, God will use his blessings, and then that'll get me to do what he called me to do. That'll get me to, you know, be loyal and faithful, but God can't do that. His ways are higher than that. He's not going, you know, man does that all the time, right? I'm going to do something for you to get you, uh, to influence you to do something. God's not going to try to influence you to do something. He cannot. He will not lose his, use his blessings as an inducement, nor will he use his judgments as a threat to encourage godly living. So he's not, he's not going to take his judgment and say, you know, I'm going I'm to threaten you by saying you're going to be judged if you don't live godly. If you don't live godly, you're going to have a car wreck. If, if you don't live godly, you, you know, you're going to lose a kid. If you don't live godly, you're going to use it. God doesn't use his judgment to threaten you towards godly living, and he doesn't use his blessings to try to, to cause inducement or try to get you to do something. So then, uh, he, since he doesn't do this, uh, uh, under grace, God first reminds us, under the grace of God, he reminds us of what he has done in grace. And then on the basis of that, he appeals for a life in harmony with that which he has done. So he says, I, I want to show you what I've done in grace. I want to show you the finished works I've done in grace. I want to show you that you're made righteous because uh, you believe it. I want to show you all that has been made available to you through the grace of God. Now, once I show you what has been done in grace, then I'm going to come to you and appeal to you to get in harmony with that which has already been done. So he says, I'm going to show you your state. I'm going to show you that you are already the righteousness of God. By grace, you're already righteous. By grace, you're already perfect. By grace, you're already holy. He says, I'm showing you that by grace, and now that you can see that it's available to you by grace, then I'm going to try to appeal to you to live a life in harmony with what grace has already done. Did everybody, everybody understand that? All right, now, but man's ways, so you see God's ways, but man's ways are not God's ways. In general, man, in general, man clings to the idea that benefits always come because of good conduct. 
So we, man, man believes that this great thing that happened in my life happened because I was good and I deserved it. And man's ways says that the losses came because I had bad conduct. Oh, I lost my house, I lost my job. I remember when, when somebody broke in my car and I thought, it happened, let me examine the bad conduct that caused somebody to break in my car. And when something happened good, oh, let me have a seminar and explain to everybody the good stuff I did so they can have the good things to happen to them as well. Hadn't we all thought like that before? Oh, you haven't? I was the only one? <laughs> Natural man always feels that he must contribute something to earn God's favor. Natural man always feels, I've got to contribute something in order to earn God's favor. I've got to be good in order to earn the right for God to be good to me. Absolutely. And that, 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 is, that is all in the church, working to be good <laughs> so that God can, can, can do something good for me. And so we have this, a man's way is, is uh, I've got to contribute something to earn God's favor, which if it's God's favor, can't you see how that just, it contradicts itself to say, if it's favor, you don't work for favor. If you work for it, it's, it's a wage or a paycheck. It's your salary if you work for it. But if it's favor, by pure fact that it's favor and a gift, you don't work for favor. Amen. It's not a favor if you had to do something to earn it. And I still, no matter how, Oh, God, I don't know how long I've been preaching on grace, but I've been preaching on it long enough. I'm thinking, and I got a pretty big microphone, I'm thinking for people to quit saying, you do these five things to get favor. If you do the five things to get favor, it's not favor you got. It was something you deserved. A man's way is if I deserve it, I, did, I do something to deserve it. I do something to contribute. And so in our relationship with God, we're constantly trying to figure out what contribution do I need to make in goodness in order to receive God's goodness. That's wrong. And that's wrong. And that's just been beating us, our brains out because of that way of thinking. God's method under grace is seen in Jesus' dealing with the woman uh, who was caught in the act of adultery. Let me show you this. Look at John chapter 8, 10, and 11. This woman was caught in the act of adultery, and they brought this woman uh, to Jesus. The Pharisees did. And when the Pharisees had gone out after Jesus silenced them, Jesus said this in verse 10, John chapter 8 and verse 10, and I'm going to read verse 10 and 11. He says, when Jesus had lifted up himself and he saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. All right, now watch this. Jesus, the first thing Jesus did here, Jesus first freely forgave her sin. Now she was, there's no question about whether she committed adultery or not. The Bible says she was taken in the very act of adultery. She, no, you understand? They snatched her right out of the act of adultery. So there was no question about what she did, but Jesus forgave her sin for which if she was under the law, and in, in this case, if she was under the law, she was worth, it was, she, she should have died because under the law, to be caught in adultery meant death. You were put to death. So he forgave her of her sins. And then secondly, he admonished her to live a life free from sin. Now notice what happened. Number one, I forgive you for something you obviously did. And then number two, after you've received this mercy, isn't that what she said? Has she, and she received mercy, right? After she received mercy and after she received grace for what she did, mercy is 
the bad that you did, uh, in, in other words, you, 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 you do something bad, but you, you, you're, not, you're not punished for the bad that you did. She, she, she did, she did, it. she committed adultery, but mercy showed up. I forgive you. Now, that's the first thing that happened. I forgive you. Receive the mercy of God. The, 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 the bad you deserved, you don't get. The bad you deserve, you don't get. The good you don't deserve, you get. That's God's way. But no, notice what he says. Mercy and forgiveness on you first. Secondly, invitation to sin no more. All right, so here's what we do. Here's what man does. Sin no more without any mention of mercy. Sin no more. You better not do that no more with not any mention of grace. So that's going to make it kind of difficult for me to sin no more without me, first of all, recognizing that there's grace and there's mercy. In fact, if you read the Scriptures carefully, he's always talking about the mercy part first, and then he talks about the thing that you ought to do in your life. Uh, I'll get to it in a minute, but it says, present your body, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And they forgot to read the first part of that. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, first, then present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. What he was saying for us is that as a church, we keep telling people, you've got to do that, you better do that, you better not 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 do that, and then we attempt to try to do it in our own ability without first of all hearing, there's mercy, Amen. there's grace. Wow. Now watch this. It's important to, to recognize this because I, I asked the question, I, I spent like two, maybe three days this week because I wanted to know why. I wanted to know why do we need to know about the works of grace before you appeal to us on how we should be living. Before you tell me I need to be holy, before you tell me I need to present my body as a living sacrifice, before you tell me that I ought not to be committing adultery, before you tell me, you know, that, that, that I need to act right, why is it necessary for me to know about your mercy and your grace first? Well, very simple. And, I, and I'll explain to you in detail. If I proceed to try to live right without knowing that there's grace, eventually in my conscience I'm going to have the fear of punishment and the fear of man. I am going to be afraid somehow along the way that I'm trying to do right because I'm afraid of punishment versus I'm living right, confident, of the grace of God. Now, this is where I want to spend my time with you this morning. If we get a little farther, we, that'll be great. But if there's any doubt that the cross has removed all of our sins, past, present, and future, if we doubt that one bit, we will doubt whether God has good in our future, and we will do something to cleanse our conscience to obtain a good standing before God or to work our way back into favor with man. Now listen to me carefully. If I doubt that Jesus forgave me of my sins on that cross, if I doubt it one bit, if you look at the stuff you've done in the past and you doubt that God forgave you, if you look at the things that you obviously committed in your life and you doubt that, that the sins have been dealt with in your life, then you will doubt whether God has good in your future. If God hadn't forgiven me of my sins, why would he do anything good for my future? If I'm still guilty of everything that I've done, why would he forgive me? Why should anything good, why should, excuse me, why should anything good come before me? 
why should I, why should I even trust that something good is going to happen? So you got a lot of people, especially Christian people, are living wondering if God's going to do anything good for me. Huh. I know you say God is good, but you, you don't know what I did. I know you say that God has mercy and grace, but I don't know. I don't know. I know you say God's forgiven me of my sins, but my sins are many. I, I, I doubt it. I doubt that he has really forgiven me of my sins. This is what you're saying. I doubt that he's going to do anything good for me. That's got to be done. That's, not, that's something we've never really meditated on really in church is the fact that are you doubting that God has forgiven you of your sins? Because if you're doubting that God's forgiven you of your sins, you know, you're going to church and you're trying to do right and you're trying to live right, but you still don't believe that he has forgiven you of all of your sins. At the same time, you don't believe he's going to do nothing good in your future. I don't believe God's going to do nothing good in my future. And a lot of people come to church a hoping and a praying that's just might. If I can just come to church or not, there you go again. Now you're trying to get yourself in a position where you deserve his goodness. Instead of just believing my sins are forgiven. If I were to die right now, I am in heaven. My sins have been taken care of. And hey, by the way, I believe tomorrow God's going to do something good for me. That's not so. A lot of struggle amongst man if you don't believe that God has forgiven me of all my sins. Say this out loud. I believe it. What do you believe? That God's forgiven you for your sins? Do you believe God's forgiven you of your sins? So is it hard for you to believe that God's going to do something good for you in your future? I got some work to do today. Listen to me carefully here now. Now, what happens now when your stance and you believe that God's not going to do anything good for my future? Well, in your conscious, to obtain good standing before God, in your conscious, what you're going to do is you're trying to figure out how do I work my way back into good standing with God. What do I have to do? And you know what most Christians do? Well, I think I go on a 20-day fast. If I, if I feel like I suffer a psalm, then maybe I might feel like I'm in good standing with God. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever felt like you were not in good standing with God as a Christian? Okay, so I must be making my point, and you just must be quiet because you might be thinking I'm talking directly to you. Everybody's thought that. Everybody's thought, I am not in good standing with God for whatever reason. Maybe I didn't pray enough or I hadn't been praying or maybe for some reason you don't think you're in good standing with God. So the natural man says, now what am I going to do to regain what you thought was a good standing with God? And, and you thought all of the stuff that you were doing got you in good standing with God. I ain't gonna miss no more church. It's that song, I'll never let you down no more. This time, Lord, I mean it from my heart. Made up in my mind, I'm gonna have a brand new start for the 1100th time. <laughs> and here's the promise, Lord, I'll never let you down no more. And the truth about that is, you will let him down next week. Do you know who God really is? In Creflo Dollar's four-part series, The Truth About God's Ways, he highlights who God is and how his unique nature sets us free. Under grace, God does everything apart from human merit. Under grace, God first reminds us of what he has done in grace. By grace, you're already righteous. By grace, you're already perfect. By grace, you're already holy. And now that you can see that it's available to you by grace, then I'm going to try 
to appeal to you to live a life in harmony with what grace has already done. This four message series is available for a love gift of 25 US dollars or more for CDs or 35 US dollars or more for DVDs. To receive this series and discover God's loving nature, call the number on your screen, scan the QR code, or visit CreflodollarMinistries.org and click eStore today. Reunite and ignite with your World Changers family at Grace Life Conference 2024. Join us at the World Dome in College Park, Georgia, July 11th through the 13th for a three-day celebration packed with surprises with guest speakers Gregory Dickow, Andrea Creighton, Inky Johnson, Bishop Clarence McClendon, and Michael Smith. Prepare to receive life-changing revelation. Don't miss soul-stirring worship with Hezekiah Walker and Brian Courtney Wilson. Text Grace Life, one word, to 51555 and get ready for the reunion. Do you have a burning desire to see lives changed by the gospel of grace? If so, prayerfully consider supporting Creflo Dollar Ministries financially. You may not be called to preach in a pulpit or perform missions work in another country, but you assist those who are called to do these things each time you give financial gifts to this ministry. God bless you, and I'll see you next time right here on Changing Your World. To support our kingdom mission of winning souls for Jesus, you may call us or give online at creflodollarministries.org. Thank you for giving and enabling us to share this gospel of grace all over the world. There is a purpose for your life. Introducing Grace Life Academy, an innovative approach to learning God's word. Grace Life Academy offers unlimited access with hundreds of hours of online teachings. You'll have access to comprehensive video Bible lessons that include features such as e-courses, study guides, an online community, quizzes, and more. Text GLA to 51555 or go online to MyGraceLifeAcademy.com. Salvation is the beginning of a new life for a believer. It is from this point that we can move into the fullness of who God has called us to be and see the manifestation of the finished works of Jesus. It is one of my greatest pleasures to help people uh, to understand who Christ is and to lead people to Christ. If you would like salvation today, pray this prayer with me. Very simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he died, that he rose again, and that he lives today. Come into my life. Save me. I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed their prayer with me, that's how simple it is. Welcome to the family of God. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe. The preceding program was brought to you in part by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries.